welcome to the photography show and the video show virtual festival if you've just joined us uh, we have dan rubin here for his session digital workflow analog world um, so if you have any questions for dan please type them in the q a box at any time throughout the session it's a little q box at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll do a, a quick q a at the end um, and if we run over and we can't answer all the questions then uh, Dan will be putting his contact info up on a slide so you can ask him your questions directly. So Dan, over to you. Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be from uh, watching from. Thank you for joining me in my um, mum's kitchen in South Florida, where I'm still kind of stuck after six months now uh, with all of this that's going on in the world. So I'm very excited to be able to finally uh, share this talk with you. Now, uh, I don't know who you are or what your background is. My background, just to give you a little bit of a, uh, of a setup for this, has always been a mixture of analog and digital, even before photography. My background is in design and a lot of design and tech for over 25 years now. And uh, some of the clients that I've had include names you might recognize. Of course, a lot of that work was all uh, digital work, digital output. I've also written a couple of books uh, that were kind of in the digital and design space, but of course the output is is tangible, is physical and analog. Um, I was creative director at Moo for a while. Some of you might have uh, their business cards or other printed uh, items. And Moo was a brilliant hybrid of uh, a digital storefront and digital printing uh, with of course customers sending digital files, but all the output was analog. And this kind of setup um, leads me into my photographic life, which started about 12, 13 years ago when I discovered photography properly as a creative through picking up an SX-70, an old Polaroid camera. So my introduction weirdly to photography as a creative output was properly analog, instant analog, uh, which was, was sort of a magical way to get started. And of course, from there, I got into all sorts of different types of cameras, including a lot of film, which is what anchors the discussion for today. But I've shot digital, at loads of different formats, loads of different camera systems. And the point of all this is to say that, at least from my perspective, and I think a lot of creatives, analog and digital already exist in the world kind of beautifully, they coexist. But in the world of photography, this isn't always viewed as a cooperative uh, relationship, I think. A lot of the time it's set up as analog versus digital because people are focusing on the tools of capture rather than the entire kind of holistic process of being a photographer and of shooting. So I don't like this being a, a versus because in again in my design career it was never an one versus the other. Everyone understood that all the tools work together. When designers got access to a computer like the first Macs and started doing design at a stop publishing and page layout we love that. All of the output, everything was meant for print, for analog, but having these digital tools helped us make that output better. We didn't really think it was that big an issue. I was very young when computers like the Mac became a thing, so I'd already been working with paints and, uh, and sketchbooks and everything else, but I loved having this as an extension of that, not an either or. Uh, one I love is the uh, process of making the first TV ads uh, at Moo while I was creative director there. We had all of these different elements from sketch uh, notes for the storyboarding to digital artwork that we would then print out to be used in the uh, what ended up being stop motion uh, work. Then the stop motion filming itself was of course done all digital on a set, but using these paper produced uh, models that we put everything together with. Now, just this is a, a quick example of one of those ads, a beautiful mixture of analog and digital all in one. And it might not play for you over Zoom. And rather than wait for it to play too long, it's only a 30 second video, you can go and look up the, uh, the that's this is the TaskRabbit uh, video, a stop motion video. But the point there being, beautiful projects exist all the time that are a mixture of analog and digital. Uh, some of my favorite projects to date have also been like this in my personal photographic career. So my first photographic book was shot all digital uh, and co-shot and co-designed with my friend Craig Maud there. This is uh, the mixture of images spread out on the floor while we were curating the book. 
um, the book was Koya Bound. Obviously the output, completely physical. The input, completely digital. The design, digital. But the design process, as you could see there, included printing things out and walking over the book. And again, I think analog and digital are not a mutually exclusive thing. And I wanna bring that conversation as much as possible to the world of photography. So a little background about why I shoot film. And we'll talk more about uh, why I also shoot hybrid sometime in a minute. But film has led me to all of these uh, concepts. I love how film renders the world. Uh, film cameras, because of the lack of distraction in the moment, allows me to stay in the moment, whatever I'm shooting, whether it's personal or a commission. Those distractions are exceptional for me, the lack of distractions rather, when I'm shooting portraits, because there's also no distraction for the subject. There's no uh, way for them to see what I've been shooting, so they trust me, they have to trust me. The subject has to trust the photographer implicitly because they can't look at the back of the camera, and I think that's a beautiful thing. It gives me a more intentional shooting pace as much as I try with any of my dis digital systems to slow down. I'm always going to shoot more because I know I can. My, that subconscious is an evil thing sometimes. And the fact that it's tangible, that I get negatives at the end, that my archive is a physical thing, that if I store it correctly, you know, will never have to be upgraded, will never be incompatible. Uh, I, I absolutely adore that. But here's the thing that usually is, is, is the most contentious, is that film for me is more cost effective and that's what we're going to dig into so first what is digital photography most people still shoot digital totally fine with that uh, this isn't an argument again but i want everyone to think about what we're talking about whenever there's that argument of one versus the other is it how the image is captured well if you capture on a film camera and then you say scan yourself using a, a camera scanning well you're shooting using a digital camera, you're photographing the negative. Is that now digital or is that analog? Even if you put it on, a, on any scanner at a pro lab or your own flatbed, you're still ending up with a digital image that has been captured by a digital camera, which is what a scanner is. So is the lines get blurred very, very quickly, I think, with uh, film photography, but also with digital photography. If your output is a print, that's now inherently an analog, tangible thing. So for me, the, I've, I've never seen there being a distinct line between the two. It's just about the moment of capture and that process, but everything else ends up being a mixture, also because we're human, right? So my photography practice, as I said, includes a lot of different cameras. I shoot everything from APS, uh, which is a, a defunct format, and I use that as... And... Oh, you might have just heard a change in microphone because even though these were charged up, they've just told me they've lost their battery. So I, I shoot everything from APS to large format. And again, multiple formats of, uh, of digital capture as well. And for me, photography is the medium, not digital photography or film photography or anything in between. This is important, I think, again. Because when we get into workflow, this is what's important, especially from a business perspective. So if you're a working photographer, whether you're part-time or full-time, it's all about efficiency. We're trying to run a business, but we're also trying to run a creative business. And this is super important, whether you're a designer, an illustrator, uh, or a photographer, or even a filmmaker. The workflow that we use is digital, regardless of what we shoot. There are very few photographers that I know who are shooting film who are commercial working photographers who work solely in analog. There are still some, and it's brilliant to see them, but it, it has its own restrictions. And even then, you still end up delivering files a lot of the time digitally. So as much as you might work in analog, it's gonna be turned into a digital workflow at some point. Every publication has a digital workflow as well. So we're inextricably tied to those things. Uh, whether it's delivering files via we transfer or whatever else to your clients, um, the digital is there. It's always there. I do know some photographers, including myself at times, where we will still use actual physical contact prints. If you've never done that, even as a digital photographer, printing out a contact sheet, um, it might seem like a little anachronistic if you shoot digital, but it's a wonderful thing to kind of give to a client, especially to be able to review in a physical sense with clients. I mean, and now, especially that we don't get to see each other face to face as much, um, being able to send someone something tangible and even 
go over your contact sheets over a Zoom call is much, much more uh, connected than, uh, than just sending people something else to look at on their screen. My workflow looks like this. So there's a mixture of, again, film, digital, and hybrid for my shoots. And I want to kind of dump a lot of information on you here. Um, so you can start to see what I mean about film saving me time and saving me money. So when I shoot film, I select film stocks, how to shoot them, um, make all those decisions. Uh, I drop the film at the lab. My main lab uh, is in London when I'm not stuck in Florida. Um, over on the hybrid side, um, usually I, I'll end up selecting film scans as reference for the d digital edits. And no matter what I'm shooting, whether it's film, digital, or a hybrid approach, um, my post-shoot kind of workflow, so with film, there's one thing that's before the shoot, and that's really selecting the film stocks. Everything else ends up being post regardless. So you're importing images, making your selects, grading, choosing your images to edit, final selects, retouching, all that stuff. That's all digital, regardless of what I'm shooting. And what I like here is that there isn't, it shows that there isn't much difference between any of these different mediums as far as the core workflow. It's all still a digital workflow. It's the most efficient way to work. Uh, one example for you, for people who haven't shot hybrid before, um, I found it very efficient when you're in this kind of mixed mode to be able to match your digital images to film. And I've got a quick uh, example here from, I've, I've, I've fallen in love with the Maston Labs. I've no uh, relationship with them whatsoever, but they're a great set of presets for Lightroom that um, allow you to, to very quickly get to a, a, a matched image when you're shooting film and digital side by side, as long as you're using one of the film stocks that their presets uh, support. So again, th this is kind of sped up, but an example of, again, my digital workflow when even when working with film, I found this to be a super efficient way of working. Um, more efficient for me than just shooting digital because I already, I'm starting with constraints. Now I've, I, when I shoot digital for years, I've had a selection of, um, of various uh, presets of my own and third party presets that I've used, but it, I can never seem to avoid getting caught up in the decision making process. When I shoot hybrid, I've got my film, everything has to match that. I'll make my film selects and then I'll fill in the gaps with digital for images that I, I'm happier with or things that I didn't cover uh, on film or things in, in slightly different lighting situations. And it's very quick, as you can see there, to get to a, a match without much effort. And that's kind of the point is that we don't wanna spend our lives staring at a screen. That's not very efficient and it's not very cost effective. So for film and digital, regardless of what I'm shooting, my process is the same, but what differs is the time. And this is where it comes to the, the money question, I think. So before that, a little bit of a, a, a set of examples here rather of why I shoot each different uh, format or approach, film, digital, or hybrid. Uh, some examples. Um, if I get complete control over what I'm shooting, this is a project I did for Dubai Tourism a few years ago. They didn't care what I was shooting and I had a very relaxed delivery uh, deadline even with all the travel. So I shot the whole thing on film. It was a brilliant, brilliant project and it allowed me, especially being, having this two or three day manic schedule in Dubai, I didn't have to think about doing any editing when I got back to the hotel room. I was free to just kind of enjoy as much as possible and worry about all of the post-production later, which is something that if, even though we're not traveling as much right now, I think having that quiet time on multi-day projects or being able to disconnect even by a few days between the shoot and the capture and not think about the post-production until a little later is very, very important. Uh, digital work, <clears throat> if there's any question about the light, if I don't know about the lighting, going into something, or if I know it's gonna be super dark, like this uh, uh, launch that I did for a, an electric car company. Uh, I knew it was gonna be dark. I had no idea how dark. I went full digital. There wasn't even a question for me. I could shoot at 12,000 ISO and still come out with really usable images and not have to think twice about it. So for me, again, that's a practical tool decision between the two. And then for hybrid, it kind of ends up being a mixture of those two situations. When I have complete flexibility, but I'm not sure about all of the lighting situations, uh, and if I don't think that I can necessarily predict every situation will be coverable with film, then I take digital with me. It's not a big, big deal, and it comes out. So this project I did for uh, the McAllen, 
uh, was a mixture of film and digital. It was a mixture of interiors and exteriors. The weather up in Scotland, you can't predict. Uh, so um, so I, I shot hybrid and the client loved it, obviously. The mixture of images for them, they all felt the same. I know which is film and digital. Other photographers might be able to pick out which were film and digital, but to the client, these images were just exactly what they looked for. So turnaround time. Time is a big factor for me. Every approach has uh, pros and cons, but um, for me, the, oh, nearly gotten to the economics there. For me, the, the key item, I think, for, uh, for turnaround time is that's, that's the big worry for a lot of people who only shoot digital, who haven't tried even shooting hybrid. And this is for those of you in the audience who might be thinking about trying to introduce film into your process, or maybe you haven't thought about it at all. People worry about turnaround time. With my main lab in London, Bayer, and with a lot of the labs that I've mailed to over time, but especially with, with Bayer, I'll drop film off um, on a morning, 9 or 10 a.m. as soon as they open, typically. Uh, and, uh, and again, this is in the days before COVID, when I could drop things off, but my friends in London uh, still do. And they'll have scans to me the next day, 24-hour turnaround. Um, I would not be able to edit a full digital shoot in that same period of time unless I skipped a lot of the normal life things that happen, which is usually what we do. We don't sleep as much, we don't eat as much, we don't take care of ourselves when there's a, ted a deadline crunch. So that's one of those issues that for me doesn't actually exist with film, especially if you have a lab that you can build a relationship with. So I'm gonna try and burn through the, um, the economics here. Now, hopefully you've had your tea or your coffee I'm going to take a sip here because this is where I proved to you what I said earlier, that the biggest thing for me, the revelation for me was that shooting film, hybrid or fully film, actually saves me money. Now it saves me money because of time. So to understand the economics here, you have to understand the cost of your time and the value of your time, which I find a lot of creatives are really bad at doing. Um, our time is valuable just because our time seems to be free because it doesn't cost us anything out of pocket. We're not actually paying someone else for our time. We tend to give it away far too quickly. So let's look in business terms at the ROI, the return on investment of shooting film. So I've pulled out a couple of examples here. They're in dollars because they're I, I've picked um, uh, some U.S film labs that I haven't used to make sure there's no kind of conflict of interest to compare against. So the average film cost um, here might be uh, in this kind of range, $45 or, uh, you know, $9 per roll for a 35 millimeter Pro 400H from Fujifilm uh, or $7 per roll of 120, right? Uh, some labs that I pulled out just to see the variance. You can see there's a mixture. So there's Carmen Citas in Spain, Canadian Film Lab, who I've used for years. They used to be UK Film Lab, uh, Bayer in London, The Find Lab, Richard Photo Lab. Um, there, there's, there's a pretty big range, so you can actually um, change the cost of your actual output on, on working with a lab. Uh, I'm not going to dive into home scanning yet because that's actually, I think, more time consuming, so more expensive. You'll see in a minute. But a quick example here, I know this might be like going back to school for a moment, but if you shoot under this math, 15 rolls of 35 millimeter, send them to Richard, uh, for instance, your cost would be about $480 for that 15 rolls. Um, send them to a different lab in the US, the Find Lab, 375. So even for those of you thinking, ah, oh, well, I, it, it, like there's a cost involved, um, you can still manage that cost. But that's not the, the cost part of it that I'm wondering about. Because a lot of people will think that seems expensive. And why? Because they're comparing it to their time feeling like it's free. Much like shooting digital feels like it's free because we're not shooting roles that we have that we have a physical cost associated to we just have sd cards or cf or whatever you're shooting and that they seem free so we also shoot more right the thing with time is that valuing it properly isn't easy right so these are some questions to ask yourself since we're not in the room and i can't ask you to give some feedback directly how many images do you typically capture during a shoot all right, think about that. How many of those do you typically deliver to a client? So what is your subset? What is that percentage of the overall capture uh, amount that you actually deliver that is your end product? And how long do you spend 
on all of the post-production for those images. Now that post-production is everything from the ingest, from bringing those, those uh, images onto your computer, um, reviewing all of them, rating them, deciding however you approach it to which ones you're gonna spend time editing, and then the actual edit themselves and retouch and then packaging them up and sending them off to the client. Um, and, and then finally, how do you factor in that time in the overall budget? Do you count edit days? Do you charge for those? Do you charge hours? Do you charge per image? You have to know all of this in order to understand how much each image is costing you and how much it might save you shooting film or shooting hybrid. So a lot of that for me ties into a concept called value-based pricing. And that's how most photographers work, uh, whether they know it or not. It's a a popular uh, term and concept in the design world for agencies. And this is that rather than charging by hour or charging by day, uh, and, and the longer a project goes, the, you know, the more it multiplies by that fixed factor, uh, you instead charge by the value that you perceive the client having for your work. And that might mean that the same type of shoot might cost more for a client that can afford more, a bigger company, for instance, than it will for a mom and pop shop or a corner store. So if you work that way, um, first of all, I think it's, it's a lot more flexible and allows you to, to get more profit whenever you can, which is very helpful. But it allows, for me, it allows me to work with a range of clients rather than those that can afford a fixed rate. So that's one thing. Um, but as a result, shoots are likely gonna cost the same regardless of whether I shoot film or digital because I'm pricing for the client. So the shoot itself, the concept of this shoot, my time before, during, and after is gonna be the same regardless of what tool I'm using to shoot. This is very important because the client doesn't care what tool you're using. They'll care about the deliverable, they'll care about the end quality, but they're not gonna care what you show up with in 99.9% .9 of the situations. So now time saved in this project, in every project equals more profit. Right, so if I'm getting paid the same amount, regardless of what I'm doing, the less time that it takes me to do that, and the biggest place that I can save time is in post-production, that means I'm making more money. So this is where I get to shooting film is equivalent to buying myself extra time. So as we wrap up here, as I check my clock to see how well we're doing, our 15 roll here budget, if we use Richard Photo Lab, would be about 480, including the film. So if we do some quick math, that comes to about 89 cents per frame. Uh, so, which is right now close to maybe, I don't know, 60, 65p per frame. Uh, it's not very uh, expensive, I think, for those exposures. So again, more questions for you. How much time do you think you spend on edits per frame? And how much per image is it worth for you to reduce that time? Think about this. Is the time you spend per image close to this, or is it worth more? If it's worth more, this is where you start getting into saving money, making more profit by introducing something like film into your workflow, even if it's hybrid. So even projects where I break even, I still come out ahead because I'm saving time. And this is something that if you can internalize, will actually uh, help you in the long run because it'll allow you to enjoy what you're doing more. So a couple of final thoughts here before we give a little bit of time for Q and A. Um, a reminder that film and digital coexist as creative tools, just like a pen and a pencil. Uh, if you've just been a digital shooter, or even if you've just been a film shooter and you haven't explored hybrid, I think you should because there are benefits to, from both sides to merging and understanding that those, your skill set is the same regardless, but you can actually get a lot of benefits from putting these two things together. And finally, remember that the combination of all of the tools that are available to us gives us uh, as much creative freedom. And that's what we should be going for to make sure that we're always enjoying what we do uh, rather than it just being the work. So with that, I'll see how much time we can spend on q and I know I rapidly went through here. This was originally a much longer presentation pre-virtual, but uh, hopefully all of this information sunk in and gave you some things to think about. So um, Alex, if you wanna come back on here and uh, Hi. Hi. Um, we haven't actually had any any questions yet, Dan. I think people must be feeling a little bit shy today. Um, so is there Hi. anything you want to expand on? Well, I did want to say, um, I, I, I managed to work pretty quickly on that. I did want to say that um, 
I, I, I do mean it if I'm on Twitter and Instagram and feel free to message me publicly or send me a DM on either of them if questions uh, occur to you. Um, now I know I went through a lot very quickly, but the, if there aren't any questions at the moment, the one thing I want you to think about is um, if, you're, if you're a film shooter, so sorry, let me say that again. If you're a digital shooter, if you've only shot digital, I run into a lot of people who shoot uh, digital and won't shoot film, or maybe they shoot film for fun. Or maybe they used to shoot film and then they became a professional and they went all in on digital. And they don't, uh, there's, this, there's a mixture of fear of, well, what if it doesn't come out? And first of all, uh, over a hundred years worth of film photography, uh, but especially a solid 50, 60 years worth of a lot of film photography will prove to you that it'll, it'll come out. It works brilliantly. And pro labs are like having uh, a digital tech, which I've had for some big shoots the, and studio shoots where I was shooting purely digital, where you have to have a digital tech next to you. And some of you might've had that as well, but having a pro lab thinking of just someone who you shoot and you're not developing at home, you're not scanning yourself, you're just having a team of professionals that you can build a relationship with helping you out is an amazing, amazing feeling because it makes you better at your medium, which we don't usually have the opportunity for when shooting digital um, because they'll teach you, they'll teach you what you could be doing better. You can have a conversation with your lab over time and again, build the relationship even with how the images look when they get to you. So you have less work in post-production to do without that increasing your cost to the lab. And thinking about it in this way, again, thinking rather than you being an island as a photographer and having to do everything yourself is a super helpful way to uh, reduce a lot of the stress, again, increase your actual profit margin, which is really, really important, but also spend less time in front of a screen and more time doing what you love, which is taking photos, uh, or more time with family, or more time doing anything other than days and days and days worth of post-production and edits, which a lot of the photographers I know end up spending a lot of their life on. Thank you. Um, we have, have had a few questions now, so we might have time just for one or two before uh, we finish. Um, so from Bill, uh, can you talk about your creative choice um, leading up to the choice of film for your project? Sure, well, so that gets easier the more you shoot, uh, right? Which is not too different from if you're shooting uh, digital and you're trying lots and lots of presets, uh, it, it, that'll take a lot more time until you figure out the ones that work for you and the look that you like, or even if you're just you know, editing from scratch on a digital file. So uh, I, I've been shooting for long enough now that I have my favorite go-to film stocks. So for black and white, I have, I have a couple of different ones I use, but if I'm, if I'm not thinking about it, I'll use Ilford HP5 and I push it to 800, which means I get a little bit more sensitivity, twice as much sensitivity to light. I love the way it looks. I know that it's pretty much bulletproof and I know how to expose it in lots of different situations. And because it's so reliable, I don't have to think about it. I know if I'm shooting black and white for even a portion of a shoot, that will give me results I like. I might choose other stocks, either for higher sensitivity or a different look, more grain, something less grainy, a little bit more contrast, whatever the, the particular art direction is. But again, the stocks that I will work with are ones that I've used before. So a lot of my personal work ends up being very experimental. If there's a film stock I haven't used enough, I'll shoot a personal project on it or just travel with a couple of rolls of it and experiment a little bit so I feel like I understand what it what it is capable of doing. On the color film side, uh, I primarily shoot color negative rather than slide film. I do shoot some slide film, Provia and, and Ektachrome. I'm, I've loved experimenting with that. Haven't used those on any commercial projects yet, but I've been pushing slide film lately and, and loving the results. But for color film, I, I would love to shoot Kodak Portra 800 all the time um, if I could. Uh, and I, I usually do when, I, when it's my choice and the and I know the budget's there for it. Uh, the same goes for um, Lomography Color 800. Uh, these negative films are, are so good. At, they have a massive dynamic range. They're really, really consistent. And each of those two have slightly different color palettes. But for me, they're beautiful color palettes. And the grain is so fine that it allows you a load of flexibility. Both those film stocks also push really well, which means if you haven't shot film before, you can have it processed as if it were a higher ISO. So I'll shoot Portra 800 
um, even for daylight work, uh, if I want everything to be really sharp and have um, everything in focus, shoot at uh, small apertures, I'll push it to 1600 and it handles it really well. Uh, and the third one that I end up using quite a lot when it's appropriate is uh, Cinestill 800T. So again, an another very, very high quality, uh, higher ISO film. It pushes really well, one or two stops. And for low light, especially for situations where you have any kind of uh, artificial light source, uh, it just has, it gives you an incredibly cinematic look, a really brilliant color palette. And uh, and again, it's, the results are really, really high quality. So um, I, I kind of base it on the art direction and the mood boards uh, and that work that happens early on, that will influence what film stocks I know to pull from. But the way I know what to pull from is that I just try as hard as possible year after year after year to shoot as much as possible and have the conversations with my lab about how I can get the best out of each film stock because they see so much more of every film stock than I am capable of shooting in a short period of time. So again, lean on your labs and that helps a ton. Awesome, thank you. Well, I think uh, that's all we've got time for. Um, there are quite a few other questions on here, but uh, if you guys want to just message Dan um, with the details on the screen um, on Twitter or Instagram, and he is happy to get back to you. Certainly am, and I'll do that today. I'll, I'll go straight to it if you do. And uh, Alex, if you, uh, before we end the, the call, the chat, if maybe you're able to screenshot those, if that's yes, I think I think we can email. download them. So I'll send them over okay. to you, and then yeah, maybe we, yeah, and at least we'll have them in mind. Um, but yeah, please do reach out to me on on Twitter or Instagram. Um, I'll be around the rest of the day and and even into the rest of the week if you uh, think of a question later on. Thank you again, all of you, for joining. <laughs>